Hope everyone is doing well this evening. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I hope everyone have, is doing well this evening. I'm E. Vingler. Uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a weekly critical look at Canada's role uh, globally. And according to my sendouts uh, via a Mailchimp, this is the hundredth sendout. So I, I think this is the hundredth episode of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, uh, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And I have breaking news to report, very positive development, uh, which we'll get into more in detail later on. Uh, but Selena Robinson, the, the uh, 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 arch Zionist uh, minister in BC, um, has just been pushed out of caucus. Uh, that just was just reported uh, 30, 40 minutes ago, um, which is a great, it's a very big development. Uh, I think it could have fairly significant ramifications. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, uh, later on in the, uh, in the uh, session. So beginning, um, David Puglesi at the Ottawa Citizen had a, a piece titled Unprecedented Level of Secrecy surrounds costs and works work on $80 billion warship project. So Puglesi is being uh, stifled for getting any uh, information on this uh, monstrous, uh, huge outlay of public funds for these uh, 15 surface combatant uh, vessels. $80 billion up front, that's, that's I think now considered the minimum uh, and uh, I think it's about as much as three times that over the life cycle. So we're talking about a quarter a trillion dollars or more over the life cycle. Uh, and uh, and we're basically not the public's not allowed to know what's going on. And um, so basically, it sounds like the costs just exploded in large part because they've um, the K military has wanted to make it more and more interoperable with the US, uh, get US um, technology on these uh, uh, surface combatants, buy all kinds of high-end US uh, weapons. And uh, and it's just exploding the costs, uh, but we're not uh, allowed to uh, uh, to know what's exactly uh, uh, taking place. There was a piece in the, I think it was in the Financial Post um, about McEwen, who was the founder of Gold Corps, and he set up, uh, he's, he's trying to raise $100 million for a copper mining project in Argentina. And the story was basically saying that he's trying to sell that the conditions under this new uh, so-called anarcho-capitalist Miley, that the conditions are, are um, ripe for uh, profit making in, in Argentina. Uh, there was also a story in today's Globe about the ombudsperson and how um, the Canada's uh, corporate uh, core uh, ombudsperson, uh, corporate accountability, that the government is going to uh, review over the next, I think, six months, they said, the mandate uh, and the fact that they haven't, uh, it hasn't succeed, successfully um, investigated uh, uh, any, um, any Canadian company for abuses abroad. And of course, as we know, the, the, Trudeau government actually came up with a decent looking proposal for an ombudsperson in 2018 and then the mining sector went hard, hard, hard in lobbying. And then a year, year and a half later, the position became a sort of uh, watered down position with very little powers and uh, basically an advisor to the, uh, uh, to the, to the minister. And, um, and uh, and it's done basically nothing, though it does have, I think it's about four, I think they said $4.6 million budget. Um, anyway, so there's going to be a review of it. That's a good thing. Uh, the In the Globe piece, the mining official, Mining Association Canada official is saying, you better not give them any any real powers <laughs> um, uh, in this review process. We'll see where that all, all goes. Front page of the Globe, I think on uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, was all about how the uh, Uyghur advocacy uh, project uh, that Tati, uh, that they were withdrawing from the foreign 
uh, interference inquiry. And um, they don't want to be, uh, uh, they don't want the politicians to be able to cross-examine, to be able to sort of challenge anything they say. And uh, what, as I've mentioned previously, this is a U.S. government funded organization that's a big kerfuffle about how they are withdrawing from this foreign interference inquiry. That's never mentioned, that the fact that this is a foreign funded organization uh, designed to, uh, funded to lobby Canadian parliamentarians, and uh, uh, that that um, uh, is left out of the, uh, the Globe and Mail uh, uh, story. Uh, John Price has a, a discussion paper uh, through the University of Victoria, the uh, Canada-China Focus, titled The Five Eyes and Canada's China Panic, a Threat to Diplomacy, Research, and Peace in the Pacific, uh, that um, kind of pushes back against the panic around the foreign interference, China's power, all these questions. I haven't had a chance to read it all. I've read lots of John's uh, previous writing books, articles. Uh, I'm sure it's got lots of uh, lots of good stuff in there. Um, the Conservative Party officially asked for uh, Iran to be examined in the foreign interference uh, inquiry, uh, which is um, is increasingly just like all all of our all the official enemies should be examined in this foreign interference inquiry. Uh, when you add Iran, you already have, of course, China's principal next is is uh, is Russia. That's being looked at, and they added under some pressure from the from the NDP. They did add India after the assassination there, and um, uh, but but the conservatives want to throw in throw in Iran, and I, the idea that Iran has like some sort of substantial power in Canada is just uh, you know China at least is actually a, you know a, a emerging superpower. Uh, Iran is a is not particularly populous not uh particularly wealthy um it's you know russia is a historic uh power at least uh the idea of iran is just is just kind of reaching and especially if you know the history of canada's role in helping oust government in iran backing a uh um a monarchy that was quite repressive uh but uh, but this is part of what this inquiry is 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 all about one of the things that came out in this inquiry uh, that some of the, these right-wing establishment folks uh, highlighted is one of the uh, presenters said that uh, Canada is a net importer of intelligence. And kind of like th there's this whole idea that we have to be really like deferential to the five eyes, the the alliance with the Canada with the NSA and the British equivalent and Australian and um, New Zealand, we have to be really deferential to all this because we we import this this like security information. But what's ne never unpackaged and all that is like what are we talking about here, right? Like these threats and and this in, this information that we're supposed to be getting, we're benefiting this great deal we get benefiting from this intelligence, the security. Like what is that, right? Is it like about how like you know Lytton BC is going to get wiped out by another? Uh, a forest fire after the hottest days on record? Is it about how like, you know, there's a housing crisis across the country. And if we just put some money that we're putting into these naval vessels into building social housing, we could eliminate that, but we're not allowed to do that because that's not with the capitalist market. It, like, like, what is this intelligence? So like, it's like, we have to be so deferential to all this because we're a net beneficiary but, but what we're talking about is really just intelligence about how the U.S. can dominate the world, right? That's what that's the core of what we're talking about. That's what NSA is offering the Canadian government. They're not It's not offering, like, what's real, the security threats of, like, the vast majority of Canadians. Probably in some occasions, they're offering some intelligence that's beneficial to Canadian corporations, uh, mining, exploiting in, you know, in the Congo, probably. That, that probably does happen. Um, but, but, like... When you dive down into it, is this really like what Canadians' security uh, um, uh, are you know benefiting from? Anyway, so I think that's a that's a it's sort of completely left undiscussed in 
in these uh, in these uh, conversations in the dominant media, it's just sort of accepted that this is like a great thing to have more intelligence about what the U.S. empire, um, how they want to rule the world. The Financial Times published a piece titled EU Shifts Funding Focus from Climate to Defense. And it basically says that uh, because of Ukraine, in large part, and also some pushback uh, on some of the policies, like we're seeing some of the farmer, farmer protest pushback, that the European bank is, uh, unfortunately, uh, deprioritizing funding for climate, you know, mitigating a climate disaster. And this, we, we saw this even before the Russian invasion, the whole ramping up of this sort of security discussion that the Russian invasion, uh, you know, contributed to, takes us away from dealing with these real security issues, the the existential long term security issues of the climate crisis, and uh, and that's manifesting um, uh, concretely with with less funding um, into uh, climate projects from the European Union, unfortunately. Now uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, they did just get the a confirmation of uh, 50 billion from the EU, uh, which is mostly loans. And that was uh, took a long time. It was a big struggle. Uh, they did, Ukraine did get that. I think it's two thirds loans. So Ukraine, come, if, in the best case scenario for Ukraine, it comes out of this without, you know, Russia having too much of its territory. It's going to be completely dependent uh, financially. Its debt is uh, off the, going to be off the charts. And, you know, all the power is going to go to the, to the, the, um, the creditors, um, but um, but it did get that. But, but aside from that, all the other the news coming out of Ukraine is really, uh, of course, Zelensky fired the top uh, military commander. Uh, there was uh, uh, that University of Ottawa professor uh, Kachanovsky posted an image of of him with the head of the right sector, uh, kind of like as a threat, presumably to Zelensky that he's got these like hard line. Uh, fascists, um, uh, right sector Azov um, battalion uh, types uh, in his corner. Uh, it's not it's not clear where that's all going to go, but it, it definitely speaks to some serious divisions within the upper echelons of the Ukrainian uh, government, uh, which could spill into something quite um, quite significant. The Financial Times ran two different pieces, one on the front page and then a long, a long uh, in-depth article this week about how basically the Russian economy is doing uh, wonderfully and how the IMF doubled Russia's growth outlook. Uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's, its GDP for 2023, I think, went from projected 1% to 2.5%. And then its projection for this year is uh is up to like around three percent or something like that I think and Russians or government saying they might even hit like four percent so it's it's like it's actually the, the economy is doing uh, uh, much better than most um, uh, wealthy countries uh, uh, economies and of course this is this is a this is a disaster from from Ukraine's perspective because uh, this means that the, the you know the, the cost all these sanctions uh, they have been fairly uh, ineffective. And it means that Russia can keep going and political cost to, to Putin and stuff like that is is going to be fairly is you know fair unlikely to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, um, significant. Now, a alongside that, you have Rick Hillier, the former head of the Canadian military, who's real like a, a real hawk on Ukraine. He's got a he in the Saturday National Post. There's a big interview with him where he's basically hinting, strongly hinting that Ukraine's on the cusp of collapsing. And, and he's, the framing is it's going to lead to like hundreds of thousands of, of Ukrainians who are going to, uh, uh, who have the ability to, to, to immigrate to Canada, and that they're going to be um, uh, uh, trying to get in as, 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 uh, as it looks as the likelihood of, uh, I guess, Russian victory is, you know, he's a little bit unclear what he, what he means exactly. Uh, increases. Um, there's also a report, uh, I believe this was in the New York Times, I didn't see it in the New York Times, but I, uh, someone uh, quoting it uh, a few different places about uh, uh, Ukraine's life expectancy 
Male life expectancies have dropped by 10 years, apparently. It's down to 57, which is uh, not much uh, around um, some of the sub-Saharan African uh, countries. The, the country has the lowest uh, birth rate in the world. Uh, according to this, I think it's the New York Times, uh, 20 to 40, 20 of the 20 to 40 year age population, uh, as quote, will completely die in combat. So basically, it's it's just a disaster uh, for men, particularly, uh, uh, I think, just for the country in general, the, the demographics are, are catching up uh, to Ukraine, the their ability to continue the fight is going to diminish with time. Uh, they just simply don't have the people compared to compared to Russia. Uh, there was all kinds of demographic problems in in the country beforehand, and that's just you know massively increased. Uh, now uh, that hasn't stopping the Canadian officials from sort of kind of pushing the same line. The the um, the Conservatives, of course, have been criticized recently for for backing off supposedly sort of following, you know, backing off from the NATO proxy war, but the conservatives are pushing back against that. And they, they, they're they making a big thing about a globe peace title. Conservatives urge Ottawa to send aging rockets to Ukraine. And they're claiming that the Ukrainian military wants these uh, missiles that Canada was going to decommission. I don't know enough about the ins and outs of how this all works to, to really you know, understand how much of this is just political posturing and how much of it may be real. Um, the NDP, uh, Heather McPherson, uh, tweeted out, the Conservative Party just denied my motion calling for Parliament to immediately call for the release of Vladimir Karamursa, an honorary citizen of Canada and tireless voice for Russian democracy and human rights. So she's really hit, hitting this idea that the uh, the, that um, Poliev's party is going soft on Russia. Uh, um, Melanie Jolie was in Kyiv, I believe, uh, in Ukraine. I think she went to Kyiv. Um, uh, and uh, she announced what they're calling the Coalition for, for a Return of Ukrainian Children. And, of course, there's, I think it's about 20,000, uh, according to the Ukrainian statistics, um, uh, children that Russian that sort of been brought to Russia, and they're framing that as as this, you know, the horrible uh, policy the Russian uh, uh, government. The Russians, of course, uh, deny that, and they say there's all kinds of different explanations for why those kids are in Russia. Uh, they have family members there. Their you know parents couldn't be found. Uh, on and on and on. Um, the the Ukrainians, of course, frame this as genocidal. I find that all that whole rhetoric very kind of hard to make that much sense of when you look at the sort of um, linguistic, cultural uh, connections. Most of the kids are, of course, from, you know, Russian speaking and, and um, often Russian or culturally uh, uh, Russian areas of Ukraine. So this business of this being like sort of this a way to wipe out Ukrainian culture and stuff like that uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, uh, but uh, but this is being the Canadian government's now starting this initiative to really hype up this issue. Obviously, and they're made pretty open about it. This is just a you know way of getting countries that are kind of not totally into the NATO proxy war to give a kind of humanitarian angle to you know criticize uh, Russia uh, or the like. The um, one of the story I saw so the push for uh, uh, Diana. F Francis in the uh, uh, Financial Post, prominent uh, uh, business columnist for decades now, I think, uh, in the Financial Post, she has a piece calling for the case for conf confiscating Russian assets. I'm not sure if it was in that article or another one, but but it says that Canada actually froze 16 billion in Russian deposits at the start of the war. I didn't know that. It's a bit a bit higher number than I would have I would have expected. But so that's 16 billion in. And I think Russian uh, central government assets that were in Canada that have been uh, have frozen, and that's what <clears throat> there's now a whole push to take those and and give them to the uh, to the Ukrainians. Uh, another just a little aside on all all this in a globe piece, they pointed out that the second and third richest Ukrainians are actually uh, uh, Ukrainian-born Canadian entrepreneurs. Uh, this Maxim Litvin and Alex. Uh, Shevchenko, 
um, who apparently set up uh, Grammarly. Um, anyways, I thought that was interesting. I, I, I didn't I didn't know that. It just deepens the idea of just how much how many ties there are between Canada and uh, <clears throat> and Ukraine, and how much Canada has played a role in pushing Ukraine towards a certain type of nationalism that's that's um, that fits with NATO's. Uh, uh, objectives, which of course is to uh, 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 target uh, target Russia. Um, there was also a, a Globe piece about the um, uh, the they they classified some of the stuff cabinet discussions on um, the Nazi war criminals in Canada, and um, they quote um, they quote um, uh, Pierre Trudeau basically being opposed to. Uh, to removing the citizenship of some individual who was apparently involved in killing 5,000 uh, 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 Jews in, in, um, in, uh, during World War II, uh, obviously a Nazi. Uh, um, and uh, Pierre Trudeau was, uh, took this position of we don't want to bring into question any uh, uh, citizen, citizenship rights of, of those who came after World War II. I, you know, Nazi collaborators, uh, SS soldiers, whatever, uh, and uh, because this would sort of open open up a whole can of worms in terms of of uh, uh, making people feel vulnerable, their citizenship vulnerable, and this could lead to sort of ethnic conflict in Canada. That's how apparently Pierre Trudeau argued it within cabinet over quite a quite an extensive period of time, going back to like the '60s, according to the story. If, if I'm not if not if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Anyway, so that just goes into the whole that comes out of, of course, the Hunka, the Hunka Parliament uh, uh, applause for the former SS uh, uh, soldier. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, the it, it's getting worse. I mean, we'll get to the Palestine question in a second, but but you know, there American strikes in Iraq and Syria. Uh, there, I, I saw. I, I haven't heard more, but. Al Jazeera a couple hours ago, briefly, uh, I think some more U.S. bases were hit today, and there may even be uh, U.S. soldiers that are killed again I, in Syria or something. I, I don't know the I don't know the details of that. Uh, also, the more strikes in Yemen today, um, two days ago I believe it's now, they targeted thirty six different uh, thirty six different targets in in Yemen, the U.S. and U.K. And the Canadian government's response to this was to basically boast that we helped out uh, with this. I think there's four or five countries that were on the press release uh, saying that they had helped uh, with these strikes in, in Yemen, which, of course, violate international law. They're explicitly tied to the, the government of Yemen or most of Yemen, the Houthis, uh, popularly known as. That they, you know, began targeting ships uh, in solidarity with Palestinians being genocided in 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 Gaza, and uh, and that's that challenges U.S. power, that challenges you know U.S. Israeli domination of the region, and so the U.S. has started these campaigns to target uh, uh, targets in Yemen, and Canada's you know going along with all this and contributing in our in our small way. Now in Gaza, we're Past eleven thousand five hundred uh, children that have been killed, confirmed. I think there are many more under rubble. Already eleven thousand five hundred in uh, less than four months. Uh, I think the full total is around uh, officially is twenty seven and a half or something like that. Uh, it's just totally uh, incredible the destruction, of course, that people have been seeing. Story about the ecological destruction. I mean, I think this will play out over time and we'll just, you know, how much uh, the ecological damage is, is taking place. But one story says uh, the carbon footprint of Israel's war exceeds annual emissions of 20 small countries uh, already, let alone all kinds of other uh, destruction. The head of uh, UNRWA, the Rousing Re Refugee uh, uh, Body, uh, Philip Lazzarini, told the Financial Times that, the, that Israel hasn't offered any evidence yet of its allegations about these alleged leaks of their employees with uh, Hamas's operations on October 7th. So all they know is what's coming out in the media. So all these governments, including Canadian, suspended their assistance to the 
main body that can get food into those who are being genocided and who you know are facing famine conditions. And Israel has it even now. It's about uh, I guess ten days, two weeks almost. Uh, and Israel still hasn't provided any actual assessment. So we're just going. Basically, we're all operating on Israel's word. Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, uh, La Presse had a column. The one of the uh, sort of establishment, um, uh, forgetting her name right now, uh, columnist in La Presse, a uh, column about the Canada cutting funding to UNRWA in the context of the International Court of Justice ruling of Israel's plausible genocide, uh, calling explicitly to you know bring in, uh, enable humanitarian assistance into Gaza, and that Canada's response to that is to cut cut, cut its uh, money to the body that can do that. Um, you know, direct complicity in genocide. Anyway, she uh, she has a piece basically saying, uh, talking about 2020, Trudeau saying, you know, back Canada's back on the world stage and the whole UN Security Council uh, battle for a seat on the Security Council. And she points out that the two, cut, two of the European countries that haven't cut funding to UNRWA are Ireland and Norway, which are the two countries that beat Canada for the Security Council seat. So it, you know, confirms... Uh, uh, my and probably many people on this call, the work that we did in terms of opposing uh, uh, Canada's bid for Security Council seat, and she just sort of, you know, bringing that together, um, uh, connecting it back to that history, which I think is is, is worthwhile to do. Uh, the Maple reports reported, and I think it's then been other corporate media picked up on it. The Trudeau government admits it authorized new military exports to Israel. Uh, after October seventh, uh, they're all it's all kind of still vague about details there. Uh, the New Brunswick Media Co-op uh, published an editorial. Who who is who is holding the line for Palestine? The media question mark. The media certainly is not. And what I found a bit interesting in in it, and I maybe I maybe knew this and forgot it, which is that the basically they go into the coverage in the. Telegraph, it's not the, the Fredericton paper, something Telegraph, I'm um, uh, forgetting it right now. They go into the coverage and they point how terrible their coverage has been of all these protests that are happening in Fredericton. And this this kind of surprised me a little bit because oftentimes, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of rare to have protests in smaller communities. And oftentimes you can kind of get in, get some corporate attention, media attention, because it's sort of local angle kind of stuff. But what the what the story points out, which I maybe knew at some point, but I'd forgotten, it's a post media paper, right? It's a it's a it's part of the chain. So post media has bought up so many of these papers across the country that this, you know, like really establishment line on this issue and, and across the board um, is is really sort of, you know, feel felt really at the local level. And um uh, which maybe is not surprising, but but is 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 important to to um, to remember. Uh, the uh, CJAD, the Montreal radio station, had a piece saying that uh, uh, CJ CJ sends Canadians to Israel to report on the ground. So apparently, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, main lobby Israel lobby group, sent a bunch of reporters to did it organize a trip for them, and then the CJ interviewed this one reporter, this one influencer that had participated in this trip. And it's all, you know, when you when you when you think about this, you're like, you see how this is another trip, I think, from the one that the maybe it's the same one, I don't know, but a couple of weeks ago that the head of the National Post, uh, uh that Joe Warmington from the Toronto Sun and others were 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 part of. And when you when you see this, like you know, the media is already so pro-Israel, but from the, from their perspective, they wanted even more pro-Israel, and then they they're gonna fund these trips. Um, so that's uh, just you know further how the how the media bias plays out. There's a story in the Globe today which um, uh, talks about lobbying trips, international lobbying trips, and the the. Um, I don't know if it's Auditor General, the Ethics Commissioner, I think. Uh, uh, I saw this six months ago, maybe, something like that. They had decided that the MPs could no longer take free trips, international trips, to places uh, from groups that were 
uh, registered lobbyists. I didn't get this nuance because I was a little surprised about the seeing the, the trip there that was uh, took place where House Father uh, a couple six weeks ago the genocide promotion trip where like five or six MPs went went to Israel, and I was a little confused because I thought that this had been had been as of the start of the year was was um, was no longer uh, uh, allowed. Now, but I, what I understand from this piece is the catch is, is that it's groups that are registered lobbyists. And so what's these trips? So Seizure, of course, is a registered lobbyist. But that trip that Housefather and, and other MPs took, that was um, actually the, the Feder Jewish Federations. So Seizure is the advocacy arm of the Jewish Federations. So I'm assuming what happened here is, but because the Jewish Federations aren't officially registered lobbyists, they can still pay for these trips. But but so it's just it it, it becomes kind of hands off and CJ I guess can take journalists that's not against these rules um, and it's not just you know not just CJ to be fair uh, they are the biggest they are the you know the the Taiwan trips free trips to Taiwan historically trips to Israel number one trips to Taiwan have have been the biggest uh, paid uh, international um, uh, sort of lobbying uh, gifts to MPs. Uh, but there is, there also was some MPs that went to Palestine, West Bank, and that was, um, I think, some off, offshoot of the the NCCM, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and some group called Muslim Canada Vote. So they probably did something similar to what Sija and and uh, the Jewish Jewish Federations are doing. I, I don't, I'm speculating here uh, in terms of kind of creating these a group that's official that is a registered lobbyist group can't do that anymore. And then what is essentially another arm of that group uh, can can do it. Um, anyways, it's something to something to uh, to follow uh, in terms of how these how you can kind of uh, get around uh, some of these uh, things. Um, the the whole question I, I brought it up in recent things, and it's going to be a theme. I'm doing another piece on that right now. Is the sort of Zionist movement as the uh, a cutting edge of fascism in Canada? And we're seeing many examples of that. Uh, you see uh, uh, the the uh, siege of Toronto. Uh, I talk about how they're pushing for increased mili- uh, increased police spending in Toronto. They put out a thing, a campaigning on this, uh, and said one thing: said we continue to urge councils to take action to prevent any shortfall in funding for the Toronto Police Service, so that our police have the tools they need to enforce the law and safeguard the Jewish community. And all Torontonians from the threat of hate motivated and all other types of crime. Uh, B'nai Briss has been pushing that uh, for Montreal police, increased uh, police funding. Um, the the uh, the there's uh, the algorithm, the Montreal uh, Agglomeration Council, which is some body that brings together different municipalities of Montreal. Um, they there's been this controversy. B'nai Briss has, has put in two different complaints. Because after I asked uh, the mayor of Hampstead, uh, uh, Jeremy Levy, about about um, his support for Israel uh, killing Palestinian children, and he basically told me that he he'd even if they killed a hundred thousand Palestinian children, he'd still support Israel because because good needs to pr- prevail over Israel uh, over over evil, and that that clip of that went viral like more than a million, I think one point two one point three million people ended up watching it on Twitter. And then the Gazette did a piece, and then he put out a statement, kind of not exactly apologizing, apologizing, but sort of backing away from it. Anyways, uh, a couple of weeks after that happened, uh, apparently a uh, half dozen uh, citizens, uh, members of the public, went to one of these meetings of this uh, agglomeration uh, council of Montreal and asked questions of, on this matter. Basically, is Hampstead support genocide? Some, some of that effect. I wasn't there. Now, I saw a story saying, Big, big freak out of the suburban, the B'nai B'rith put this formal complaint in that these people had like, you know, hijacked what was supposed to be urban planning kind of meeting or, you know, bylaws or whatever meeting for their anti-Israel agenda. And uh, they, they said, they, you know, they can't be possibly asking questions, whatever. They claim there's some rule that was violated. I, I'm very skeptical. And then, well, apparently the next, the January meeting, some people went to that uh, meeting again. I guess Levy wasn't at the December meeting. He was at the, gen- the January meeting. They asked questions of it. And B'nai B'rith, again, a whole big freak out about this. And then on Wednesday, in a suburban paper, this hard- hardline Zionist uh, Anglophone paper in Montreal, uh, uh, has written a couple stories about this. 
And then on, on Wednesday, it was the front page of, of, uh, of the Montreal Gazette. And, uh, and so but essentially what they're saying, what they're saying is basically you can't sit at, members of the public can't ask questions <laughs> at, at, at uh, municipal council meeting. I mean, this is just like, uh, because it's like, you know, anti-Israel and it's anti-Semitic and it makes them uncomfortable. It's just uh, uh, remarkable stuff. But it's all part of this, this, uh, this fascist tendency that we're seeing in a whole bunch of places. You know, the National Post, Conrad Black, uh, as part of you know the QP Canadian Union of Public Employees, uh, because of their Palestine solidarity stuff, he, he he has a column titled "quote Shut QP Down," and in that same National Post, that that lawyer uh, um, uh, Levitt, who for the past four months he's an employment lawyer who writes a weekly column in the uh, uh, Financial Post, was supposed to be about employment issues. Basically, every single column last four months is all about how do you, how can we get these Palestine solidarity people through? How can you fire them? How can employers fire them? And there's all this sort of legal, uh, he, he, the guy's clearly a, a crazed Zionist and he's trying to figure out how he can help help the cause of murdering more Palestinian children through his legal uh, column in the Financial Post. He also calls on people to decertify uh, QP, uh, the union. So this is more of, any sort of like nominally democratic organization, which a union is, all the problems that come, you know, but they're nominally democratic. They are trying to, you know, shut down the student union, shut down, um, and this is all part of the the uh, uh, Zionist fascism we're seeing. Um, as part of this stuff, the policing stuff, there, there's obviously successes. We've seen some story, you know, obviously arresting people in Toronto, uh, Ottawa bylaw uh, police uh, after the demo on I think it was on Sunday, maybe it was Saturday, but I think it was Sunday. In Ottawa, they they followed some uh, activist and they gave her a ticket. They claimed uh, as she left the demo, claimed that she had spoken into a megaphone. And uh, we also have a story in the Taiyi, the uh, BC uh, paper about that um, RCMP unit that's been uh, highly controversial around uh, targeting uh, indigenous activists and anti-pipeline protests. They've also been going to Palestine demonstrations. And the Thai story talks about how they frame them all as just Hamas. They're just mass rallies to the point where they actually, they have a budget line, they got $11,000 uh, for the police to deal with what they call Hamas Day of Action. So this is how the police are framing these protests as a quote, Hamas Day of Action. And that's literally in the budget line of the police getting like, I don't know what, they have to go buy like undercover materials, you know, to be go undercover or whatever materials they need uh, uh, is their framing as a, a quote Hamas day of action, and that fits within the sort of Zionist uh, fascist uh, kind of dynamic that we're that we're seeing. Um, apparently, the B'nai B'rith, as part of the whole kerfuffle around the highway overpass protests in on the four hundred one in Toronto, the uh, judge though dismissed B'nai B'rith's uh, case, and he actually ordered B'nai B'rith to cover the defendant's legal costs. And apparently, I, I didn't see the ruling, but the, the, there's, there's some good stuff in the ruling. But uh, but unfortunately, the main essence is that uh, the according to this this Twitter summary of the ruling uh, is that in fact because the police have already sort of taken charge of it, the Benebra suit against these individuals is 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 not uh, legitimate. So so because it's already been the police have already suppressed the rights, uh, therefore there's no need for this this legal suit that. Um, B'nai B'rith has, has, has pursued, though the judge as well points out there's no evidence that this was the Jews were targeted or that there was any undue kind of like intimidation and the whole line that the, the uh, pro-Israel lobby has been trying to push. Um, in, in the line of this kind of fascist tendency that we've seen, uh, Joe Roberts, who was the supposedly leftist, uh, he's a sort of liberal Zionist, gone off into total crazy territory uh, over the past few months. He refers to the protests as one thing. And, and the reason I came across this is because that um, Salima Robinson, the, the uh, BC uh, minister who just resigned, um, that she liked this tweet. And so people were one of the, one of the things about, you know, how this wasn't just a one-off comment by her about her liking this tweet. And, and he refers to his fifth, the fifth columnist, the basically pro-Palestinian protesters as the fifth columnists who, who, uh, uh, their real enemy has always been the liberal democracies of the West. I mean, this is just really hard line kind of stuff that uh, 
that uh, the supposed leftist Joe Roberts uh, and this uh, NDP uh, minister uh, are are uh, are pushing around uh, out there. And now, um, uh, so the Selena Robinson, she 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 resigned today. Uh, massive protest now. This is five days, four or five days since it's broke. Uh, there's uh, she, of course, is the the uh, post education post secondary education minister in BC who referred to uh, Palestine before European colonization as a, quote, crappy piece of land with nothing on it. And then gone on, went on, and, oh, yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of people, but they did nothing. There's no economy. A whole bunch, if you actually listen to the broader uh, discussion, which was a B'nai B'rith discussion uh, on the 30th, so last Tuesday, a whole bunch of other stuff in this discussion that's totally odious. A lot of what she said, you know, all the protests are just, are just uh, anti-Semitism. They're anti-Jewish. Uh, she's making this point, as are others on this on this discussion. Also, an important point that hasn't been mentioned. I, I wrote about this thing. Deborah Lyons, Canada's special envoy to combat anti-Semitism and Holocaust and Holocaust education, um, she was on it. She was on the a call and, and and on the webinar. And then and she speaks after uh, the real racist comments from Ro Robinson. She speaks about two minutes after the head of B'nai B'rith speaks after, doesn't say anything. Uh, he he subsequently, they subsequently backed away from it. They, they kind of threw her under the bus a bit, uh, but he didn't say anything at the time. And neither does the special envoy. And she actually goes out of her way to say how she works with Robinson to combat anti-Semitism in university campuses, i.e. criticism of Israel. Uh, she says, she calls Robinson wonderful. She said nothing about this, the, the comment about a crappy piece of land and all this kind of the racist stuff that Robinson said. Um, but, uh, so, so Robinson does this, right. And this is not, this is not a one-off. If you go, even the people have documented, people in BC have documented just example after example, after example of her posts on Twitter, or her positions she's taken public and other forums that all go in this sort of same direction. And, uh, but, but, but the other part that's important in this controversy, and I think part of why she's been finally, she's been forced out is that the other thing she did was she intervened. After Langara College found this professor had not violated the rules, they had an internal tribunal, she was suspended, she was seen as making a comment at a protest uh, in Vancouver as sympathetic towards the October 7th uh, uh, Hamas operations. Uh, uh, she was suspended, a huge kerfuffle, Knight is her name. Um, I forget, I didn't, uh, I'm forgetting first name right now. Um, uh, she, I think she's tenured. Uh, she, she, um, Apparently, the Canadian mentions this piece that goes into her background. She won an award in 2019 at SFU, I think, like top, one of the top students, this and that. She's got all kinds, she had accolades, she's been involved in all kinds of, of, of different uh, uh, protest movements, etc. And and then she just attacked, thrown on the bus, just attacked whatever. But the internal body, uh, Langer, finds that she didn't do anything that was contrary to the rules. Sija criticizes this online, and Minister Robinson, who's the post-secondary -second education minister, then quote tweets Sija saying, I disagree, this hard line, like I, she should be basically fired for her vitriol, uh, she's spewing her vitriol, says that she had met with, met with Langara uh, officials, or whatever, and then 24 hours, the internal tribunal that found no problem, uh, they, they then fire this prof professor. So, so this minister, not only just a totally outrageous comment, but she also totally intervened violation of, 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 uh, of uh, academic freedom and the CAUT, the professor's federation and the BC professor federation came out and said, Robinson has to go as minister. The BC professor's federation said this first time in their 50 year history, they've ever called to the resignation of a minister. And um, uh, so, so it was, you know, so basically, this is this Selena Robinson is like an extremist uh, uh, Zionist who's gone like let her, you know, personal views start, you know, shaping her whole uh, uh, political outlook. And um, and um, anyway, so she has she has resigned. So this is a big this is a big uh, uh, victory. Um, and and I'm, I'm curious to see where all this goes. I, I think that. Uh, the Israel lobby is going to be, as far as I know, this is the first time in Canadian history that a minister has had to go because of her anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, so that's big. Uh, and um, 
I, I think it's it's going to be a message for the NDP. It's going to have fairly substantive. The NDP came out, right? Uh, Matthew Green, to his credit, came out really quickly with a good letter. I mean, not my letter, but a good letter uh, going at Robinson for what she said. Jagmeet Singh then came out with a letter, not very good, but still contributing to this. This is wrong. This is outrageous. Both bolstering those who are calling uh, for her to be uh, to resign or for her to be removed from cabinet. And um, obviously, you know, if you contrast it, what happened with Sarah Jama uh, calling for a ceasefire and calling Israel an apartheid state, she gets kicked out of caucus. That hasn't happened, right? Robinson hasn't been kicked out of caucus. She's just no longer a minister. Uh, now, you know, you co so contrasting these things and it's totally outrageous. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, this is this is a uh, a significant uh, victory. And it, it speaks to the power of uh, of uh, Palestine solidarity, and I think it's a message that Palestine solidarity brings has some power, and and I think that message is going to be felt, uh, particularly in NDP, NDP circles. The the open anti Palestinianism is not going to be accepted. The open promotion of genocide it's there's less and less room, and um, so I think this could this message could be big. I think there's a small chance that the Israel lobby is going to try to go whole, whole hog back. Uh, and I think this is clearly what Ebi, the premier, was worried about, is that they're going to, if she comes out and says this is anti-Semitism, if, if Robinson comes out and says this is anti-Semitism, that gives a lot of space for B'nai B'rith, Sija, all the media uh, establishment commentators to, to, you know, pile on against the BC uh, NDP government saying, oh, the, the anti-Semites have taken over, it's the Hamas-loving anti-Semites, whatever. Um, I think that what Ebi was trying to get was some sort of an agreement with Robinson that she was no longer in cabinet, but had done in a kind of friendly, friendly way. So, so she doesn't come out and, and, uh, and fire at it. I think the Israel lobby will understand that this is uh, of, of uh, somewhat historic import in Canada, Palestine uh, power uh, dynamics. Um, so um, yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I'm, I've gone on too long here, but just to end off basically a bunch of good, you know, Port of, Port of Vancouver was blockaded for an arms embargo on Wednesday, Thursday, I forget what day it was. Uh, there was the online rally, An Angela Davis, Gabor Mate, uh, Roger Waters, a whole bunch of people that the CFPI, Just Peace Advocates organized, uh, well attended, uh, well watched afterwards. Uh, protest, Montreal campuses uh, demonstration that was on Friday. Uh, hundreds and hundreds uh, uh, marched through Montreal. A whole bunch of students walked out of campus. Uh, Trudeau on Monday night last week at um, at a event, I think commemorating the uh, the the uh, massacre there uh, uh, of of uh, in um, Saint Foy in Quebec City uh, seven years ago of uh, at, at a mosque. Uh, he was chased away by protesters saying, "Shame on you." Uh, same thing in another commemoration uh, of the uh, massacre in the mosque. Uh, somebody uh, targeted uh, Duplo, uh, who I don't know what ministry minister he is now, um, and he he I think he kind of had to leave the mosque. Um, the Canadian lawyers for human rights and Al Haq have announced uh, that they are going to be uh, gave fourteen days to M Minister Millie Jolie to uh, end arms. They have a serious demand, but they revolve around ending the arms uh, shipments. And if not, they say that they violate both Canadian law and uh, the international uh, the arms trade treaty. And they're going to pursue uh, legal measures within 14 days if they they don't get an adequate response. Uh, so the, the mobilization, the pushback continues. And of course, Robinson, the minister uh, resigning is a part of that and, and contributes to that. And uh, the final thing I'll say is that on the 20th anniversary of the Canada, U.S., France coup in Haiti on February 29th, February 29th don't happen every year. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary. I'll be in Ottawa for an event. Uh, I think it's seven o'clock at the Bronson uh, um, uh, Center. And um, I will. Uh, I will unmute. Uh, Lynn, go ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Lynn. I, I know that Laura is not uh, able to be here tonight. If um, maybe if there's anyone I 
I don't see uh, um, somebody can maybe mention it in the chat and I'll try to pay attention to the chat. I'm having difficulty here uh, unmuting you, Lynn. Are you try to unmute yourself or you're blocked? I'm assuming you're blocked. I'll just try to one more time. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not seeing Lynn. Is there anybody else who has uh, comments uh, or or uh, or questions? Go ahead, Sally. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, Canada's response with the blocking the UNRWA funding. Do you think that there is any kind of a groundswell that's happening that, uh, I mean, what else can we do? That is so callous and immoral. It's just hard to believe that we're part of that group. Yeah, we were just part of the group. I think we were the second and that helped spiral the other countries. Uh, we followed the U.S. kind of right away. Um, there's somebody online that pointed out that CJ put out a tweet about that at like 1.30. And by 4.30, the minister Hussein had tweeted uh, uh, saying, yeah, we're cutting, we're suspending money. Um, this was obviously all planned. This was PR. This was a big part, a large part PR from Israel's standpoint. They were trying to move the discussion away from the world court ruling. They also, obviously, also part of, uh, um, they want to destroy UNRWA important faction of the Israeli government that wants to do that as part of making life uh, impossible in, in Gaza. Um, I think there has been, I mean, they, 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 they then announced $40 million uh, in assistance to, to Gaza. That doesn't make up for it because ultimately UNRWA, these other groups can't get the resources in without UNRWA. Um, uh, I think there was a groundswell. I think that they, the government, uh, you know, kind of, they, they're caught between uh, two different dynamics, which is a public that was appalled by this and the U.S. empire and the Israel lobby uh, uh, pushing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing, I think there's a pretty good chance that they, uh, as things quiet down, they just um, continue with the, the funding as was. And apparently, according to the National Post, which the right wing is, you know, saying this is fake and whatever, that they actually made, I don't remember the number, but 20 million, 24 million, whatever it was, they're, they made a payment quite recently to UNRWA. And so the suspension doesn't really matter for a while because there is no payment, as I, as I understand, there's no payment that, that's in the works in the sort of short term from a Canadian perspective. It does matter at a, at, a, at a bigger optics level, and because it contributed to other countries being able to and to you know severing their their funding as well. Um, uh, so so you know, um, but I'm not 100 percent sure on those details. But that's sort of how I understand it. Um, but yes, there was a huge pushback. Uh, go ahead, uh, um, Lynn. If not, Lynn, go ahead, Yuri. Uh, Lynn, if you're having a hard time uh, unmuting yourself, uh, type it up and 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 maybe and and then maybe I can try to read it out loud, and I'll I'll not mute myself afterwards. Then, uh, well, Eve, my question is, uh, so I'm trying to understand what the West is doing in uh, Ukraine because I kind of sort of don't understand what like what the West is you know doing in Ukraine so like what like what's the conservative party of Canada's uh like like why are they why do they seem to play the uh, like why do why are they reluctant to flood more weapons into Ukraine it does 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 do, does any of that have to do with the uh you know with the uh, hunka you know scandal and uh and 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 are more people and 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 are more people waking up to the fact that canada is supporting reactionary movements in ukraine and that's why there seems to be you know 
it, why there seems to be more uh, efforts at some of the powers to be to not escalate the war uh, any more than it already is. Because I'm because I'm kind of confused as to what the West is trying to do uh, in uh, Ukraine, apart from just making another Afghanistan where where it's only the arms companies who seem to be making a profit out of the uh, you know endless uh, misery and whatnot. The, the 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 conservative element. My my guess here is that the conservatives are just. Poliev does have this sort of Trumpian base, and they are are become sort of kind of following in the U.S. kind of movements uh, perspective have become critical of of sending money and arms to to Ukraine. Uh, and so he's playing. He's playing to them, to a certain extent, is what what he's doing. Uh, obviously, when he's when they put out a statement saying, "Send all these uh, missiles to Ukraine that Canada was decommissioning," and but Ukrainian military says they want, uh, he's now countering that, and he's kind of sort of pressuring the 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 Trudeau government to get more you know more involved in the proxy war. Um, so my guess is he's just playing a bit to that. I, I don't I would be surprised if he changed policy if he if he became you know prime minister. That that would surprise me. I, I don't I, I think this is more just a sort of little bit of a sort of rhetorical thing that plays with some element of his of his base. That's my guess. Uh, now the bigger pro, bigger question of what's the what's the geostrategic plan, I, I don't really know. I, I I I sort of agree, or I think maybe we we're hinting at. I kind of agree that like, what what do you do here, right? Like like you, if especially if like Russia's economy, like the point here was to weaken Russia, and I think in some exactly. sense, and I think in some sense that has succeeded. I do I I kind of believe the the um, the establishment media, and I don't know that much about it, but. So maybe I'm wrong here, but my I basically believe the establishment media's portrayal that that Russia's lost power um, with regards to you know uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and that conflict they don't have the ability to exert as much power in 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 the uh, in the stands and that you know that part of the world that they may have previously been um, you know. Uh, powerful or the leading power or um so so i kind of like that kind of like makes sense to me uh that they've gotten you know all their military resources or not all but a huge amount have been devoted to ukraine and that's weakened their ability to uh assert a power uh military power elsewhere and, and economic now but because the economy is sort of doing well then you kind of they they haven't necessarily been uh, weak in that front. I think they have lost some some uh, standing in the world. So there's some element there, but but the clearly much of the world hasn't really gone along with with the uh, sanctions kind of policy and has kind of maybe criticized uh, Russia at in some UN votes, but haven't really been willing to to go very far uh, alongside NATO in that stuff. Um, so so uh yeah and and then the flip side is i think it's this has shown that the the economic power of the nato countries has been shown to be uh lacking i think that's pretty clear that this they i think there was a the expectation was that was going to be um uh more successful uh in terms of weakening russia economically that has that has just not uh um transpired um so yeah, you just keep this going and 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 calculate that that you know it still bleeds Russia uh, uh, to a certain extent, and you just don't care about you know obviously they don't care about Ukrainians. So so you know if generations of of Ukrainians is sort of uh, no longer so what from from Washington's perspective, um, but but if 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 increasing looks like Ukraine is going to be defeated, that then becomes a blow to uh, U.S. NATO uh, prestige. Um, 
so I yeah I don't I don't know what uh, uh, I don't know what the calculations are and I don't know that I, my guess is I don't really know that I, I kind of I'm not sure that they know right like I, I think you just had you had these uh, hawkish uh, you know let's keep pushing NATO uh, expansion let's let's exert our power in in Ukraine let's uh, let's you know ignore the Minsk agreements. Uh, and uh yeah you know who knows you know russia's not going to really do anything or or well we can box them in or um i don't know that 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 be kind of my guess and that they, they haven't really kind of um maybe the the long term um question but you know they the truth is the us pull out of afghanistan and that doesn't i mean us is still incredibly powerful so i don't know that they could figure out a sort of you know, Ukraine loses 30% of its territory. Um, does that really weaken the U.S.? Yeah, maybe in some sense, but <laughs> right. Like, well, well, so. well, 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 one quick, well, then one very quick follow-up question is, is, yeah, it's kind of baff, it's kind of mind baffling to me because the West clearly provoked Russia, the West clearly provoked a Russian response to 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 their disgusting imperial project in Ukraine, and I, I, you know, like the Rand Corporation even said that they would love to provoke a conflict with Russia and then try to do a sort of a color revolution in Russia and then break up the Russian Federation. But because Russia has like you know like responded, was that sort of like was the West going like oh well we didn't really want Russia to respond we just so so is the West sort of like reluctant to escalate this war past Russia's borders because that does mean nuclear war and even though they are sociopathic nobody really wants to yeah I'm, I'm, yeah I don't I I think I don't I think that the you know the Biden administration they're crazy but they're not that crazy so so <laughs> so I, I don't I think that I don't I've seen stories floating around there that you know NATO's on the cusp of like intervening in a direct way I mean they are there in a direct way, but you know that next level of you know battalions or whatever. I, I I'm doubtful that that's it could still happen, and, we, and like you know because it could still happen, it's you know a, a couple percent chance of that happening, and that then spiraling to a point zero zero one chance of nuclear war. That I mean that's way too high, of a, right? <laughs> of a mm -hmm. of a possibility. Um, but but I I think that probably the more likely scenario is they'll figure out a way of uh, accepting Russia taking a quarter of, not accepting in a full sense, but sort of accepting Russia taking a quarter of of, uh, of Ukrainian territory and trying to put some sort of spin on it that it's, you know, not really a full, not a loss. And, and I think that would be sort of correct because Russia, I mean, I don't think Russia's done very well uh, uh, militarily. I mean, if you look at all the costs of all this and stuff, but but um, yeah, so go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, um, I was just going to bring up a city council, which you had talked about, and people were complaining that they have to be discussing urban design things at council meetings. Well, you know, it's not at all hard. I follow eight city boards, okay? And I can, you know, do two things at once, you know, like anyone can. And I think people just aren't realizing how the potential for this war affects all of our local issues. There isn't one local issue that you can't say that <laughs> there's no point of spending money on this if we're all going to be blasted to kingdom come, right? So that's what I bring up. And I bring it up because I couldn't, you know, there were only 20 positions to to get on for uh, the Gaza, you know, for the open comment, right? And those got taken up right away. And there's not a public hearing like in Oakland with 500 people showing up. So, um, and I, that's what I'd push for is a public hearing. So I go to the public hearing that night on a development in this neighborhood, Peacock Place. There's a peacock on there and this guy's trying to build this uh, housing development on a floodplain. And I talk about Gaza there and the direct connection between that. And there was actually, really interestingly, another guy that testified 
that this was a big issue of this floodplain and building there and all the disaster about it years ago. And then they're trying to plug it through without really noticing the public in a deep way. And and so and this other guy that spoke right before me happened to bring up the plutonium that is redistributed to that area that should not be, you know, that's why it shouldn't be built on there. Now I have a different reason because affordable housing is not an argument for more affordable housing in a market like in Boulder, where there's an endless supply of demand for housing. So it doesn't matter how much affordable housing you put here, it just drives up the cost of housing. So that was my argument, but his was plutonium. And I realized, oh, of course, I'm working on Rocky Flats and plutonium. Rocky Flats is a nuclear, uh, you know, an atom bomb trigger factory. My mom died as a result of Rocky Flats in 1969 from being exposed in the 1957 fire where they didn't even tell the people downwind in Denver. And she, she breathed in a particle of plutonium and mutagenically, it takes 12 years before you die. The, your genes have to mutate to that point where you die of leukemia. And, um, and so I can say, I, I can make a direct correlation. My mom is like Hamas. My dad was in the war and my mom is a civilian. And she got blowback from being right at home, not being in the war from plutonium. And why we sh should we subject people in this housing development that they want to put on the floodplain because they their well went dry. It, it, it was affected by a, a big flood in Boulder in 2013. And and so they they want annexation and then the city tries to bribe them with annexation by putting more housing. But there's floodplain issues there and the city could just help them fix their well or tell them, sorry, they have to fix their well. They moved the house out of the main city of Boulder, so they're an un unincorporated, and they have to dig a well. That's their fault, you know? Um, so there's all this stuff going on, and if you can't bring it up and connect it with a national issue, like the war in Israel-Palestine or IMF Hamas, then, then what are you doing, you know? What are you doing all this local stuff for? What are you building more water lines for? What are you what are you doing all this for if you're just going to be bombed? You know, anyone yeah. can make those arguments. I, and I think it's really important to to uh, draw those draw those connections. Uh, there's some of them that are really simple, right? Like, you know, if there's housing issues, but we have all this money going into uh, uh, fighter jets and naval vessels, uh, we can build social housing where, you know, people only have to pay, uh, 35%, 40% of their income. Like we have done oh, yeah. and yeah. have done in the past. So it's, there's, there's one in Boulder called Bluebird it, for homeless people. Okay. It's zero to 30% AMI. That means the area median income. That means you can have nothing and pay nothing and live there. Yeah. 40 units well, there's, I mean, if you're homeless you get one bathroom and one kitchen okay you know what you get in gaza you get 500 <laughs> to 700 people for one bathroom yeah. <laughs> okay couldn't they find anywhere in between it's yeah. kind of luxury housing for the homeless yeah. you know and that takes care of one homeless person there's hundreds of them here so it looks good on paper right yeah, 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 but there's something that, no, but I mean, there is, there, there, we, we know that if you build more public housing, um, you, you can reduce homelessness. There, there are, there, we Not know in Boulder, that. the market's saturated. Okay. It's an inelastic market. The more you build here, the more Elon Musk, actually, Kimball Musk has a restaurant here, will show up and just buy you out. It's, a, it's, it's an, an, it's an endless demand. For housing in this peculiar area so that doesn't work here in other places it might in des moines or something but i mean this problem is extended itself all over the u.s and canada for that matter i'm sure uh, 
it's already 709 but go ahead quickly joan i because i have uh i have uh, uh parental duties i should uh, i should get to you're on you're on muted joan no you've now you've now muted yourself again hi i haven't been able to get on yeah go ahead go ahead We can hear you, eh? Oh, well, uh, that didn't work. So uh, on that note, uh, uh, same place, same time next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.